Okay, well, welcome to Module 6, and specifically Lecture 6.1. Module 6 is our first step in this course in moving away from looking at um, environmental issues and focusing a little bit more on some social and economic aspects of sustainability. And although, of course, we've brought um, economic and social aspects into the conversation in our previous lectures, um, they were definitely more focused on environmental aspects of sustainability. So this whole module, we are looking at um, economics and um, what economic sustainability really is and what it looks like. In this particular lecture, we are focused on how we measure economic development, how we maybe measure economic sustainability, and um, sort of um, understanding sort of the traditional way that we have measured economic growth and the way that we perhaps need to move towards measuring it if we're really going to be getting at an idea of um, sustainability. So by the end of this lecture, there's three things that you should be able to do. Um, you should be able to explain what the difference is between economic growth and economic development. You should understand the common measurements that we use globally to measure economic growth and development. And you should also be able to present arguments um, for both the strengths and weaknesses of these various measurements. So the key terms, there are six of them, economic growth, economic development, GNI, which stands for Gross National Income, GDP, Gross Domestic Product, and GNP, Gross National Product. And then there's a, a final term, the Human Development Index, also often abbreviated as the HDI. Okay, so um, if you have not already taken economics, you probably are required to take economics before you graduate. Um, what is the economy anyways? Um, I think um, it's imp important just to go over some of these basic fundamentals for a couple slides. The economy is basically um, the sum of all the work that happens um, in our um, global society. It's that four-letter word, word of work. We measure our economy. We are measuring the sum total of all of the effort and energy that we put in to producing the goods and the services that we need to survive, need and or want to survive and live. Um, without work, without productive human effort, nothing happens in the economy. And essentially, when we're measuring things in the economy, we are measuring the amount of work. What is being produced in terms of goods and services and what is being sold in terms of goods and services. So the economy is the sum total of human work. We work to mute human needs. So in sort of logical terms then, if we have an economy that is not meeting human needs, it's not doing its jobs very well. Because the purpose of economy, of the economy or an economy, is to meet human needs. Okay. So then, this other concept of what is economic growth versus what is economic development. Economic growth can be one part of economic development, but it is not the same thing. They are not synonyms. They do not mean the same thing and they should not be used interchangeably. Economic growth is a narrower concept than economic development. It's basically a measurement of an increase in a country's real level of real level of national output that is generally caused by an increase in what we're producing in terms of goods and services. If we increase the what we're producing as a country, it's usually because we have increased the quality of resources, we've increased the quantity of resources, or we've made improvements to our technology. And we hear a lot in our country about increasing economic growth, how we need to see a, 
increase of economic growth on an annual basis in order for our economy to be healthy. That's what we hear time and time again. Economic development is a broader term. It's a normative concept, and what that basically means, it's determined by an individual person's sense of morality. What is right and wrong, what's good and bad, that is something that I determine as a person. It is normative. Um, it is essentially a measure of the welfare of people who are living in a society, how much they have in terms of how, many, how much of their needs are being met. That is what economic development is. It's an increase. Usually if we ha see economic development occurring, it means we see an increase in living standards. Um, we see an improvement in the ability to meet needs. And we are seeing freedom from oppression and war and crime and things along those natures. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Economic growth is narrower in concept than economic development. Generally speaking, when you have economic development, you have some type of economic growth or economic sustainability, but that's not necessarily the case always. But the big thing to keep in mind is that just because you have economic growth does not mean you necessarily have economic development. And in fact, if we were just to measure how well off a country is based off of economic growth, we could have a very distorted picture of the level of income within the country and how well off the people in those country are. So here we have a picture of um, a shack in Jamaica. Obviously the family that lives in the shack is very poor, very, um, um, very much so living in poverty. The paradox though is that in Jamaica you could have just down the road from the shack a mansion that looks like this. Um, and if you just saw this mansion you would think that um, the people who lived in this country were very well off. Um, and if you looked at traditional measures of economic growth such as GDP or gross national income um, those could also make Jamaica look like a very rich country. And this is, um, we know, to not necessarily be true. Um, and this happens in the United States and all around the world. And this is because traditional measures of economic growth do not take into account how income is distributed within that country. Um, oftentimes what we know to be true is that a small proportion of a population can own a very large amount of the wealth of a country. And so um, even though the country might have a very high GDP or a very high gross national income, it's held and retained by a very small number of people within that country. Therefore, the level of welfare for the majority of humans for that population could be very much limited. So growth, um, economic growth in and of itself as a measurement um, does not necessarily give an accurate representation of the level of development within those countries. Okay, so how do we then um, distinguish between what is a developing country and what's a developed country? Those are terms we use a lot in this class. Um, how do we measure development? Well, there are actually very many different ways to distinguish between developing and developed countries. And there's also a lot of different ways to measure development. Um, and this issue of measuring development has been quite controversial um, over the last half of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, and our thinking about it has evolved, thankfully, over time. The most common and widely used measure of development is per capita income of a country. Per capita income is an indicator of how much purchasing power people within that country have. Um, it is a measure of how much goods and services people within that country can purchase. And there are two um, 
there are two measures of per capita income. So per capita income is the most common measurement of development. And within that, um, there are two different ways of doing this. We can measure um, gross national income and or gross domestic product. Both gross national income and gross domestic product measure the overall level of economic activity that's happening within the country, and they're both very closely related. Gross domestic product is the total value of all goods and services produced in a country. Gross national product is simply that the GDP plus um, net flows of foreign factor income, essentially. Um, so per capita income is usually proxied by either gross national income per capita or gross, gross domestic product. product gross domestic product per capita. Um, so basically they're just measurements of how much wealth there is within a country um, and how much goods and services are being produced and sold. Um, one includes income from that flows into the country from foreign sources and the other one doesn't. Um, gross domestic product is definitely the most common used between the two. Um, we usually do it in a per capita um, basis so that we figure out what what the gross domestic pro product is uh, per person um, as opposed to um, just looking at the total dolly value because obviously if you have millions of people in your country versus billions of people within your country, your gross domestic product is different. Um, and you also will hear talk of real gross domestic product, and that's basically um, a way to account for differences in how much things cost in different countries. So that's what GDP is. I know you know this. I know you've um, interacted with this terminology before. If you look at 2016 data, um, the United States remains far and away excuse me, <laughs> the world's largest economy. It has a GDP currently of about $18.5 trillion. Um, this is notably probably because we have a very high average incomes. We have a large population. Um, we have large capital investments. We have relatively low unemployment, high consumer spending. We have a young population. Um, and there's a lot of technological innovation that's happening. So all of those things combined make for us to have the largest gross domestic product in the world. There's a tiny little country called Tuvalu, I, I believe is how you pronounce it. It has the smallest national economy with a GDP of about 32 million. Um, it has a very small population. It does not have a lot of natural resources. It relies a lot on foreign aid. Um, it has um, low average incomes, education levels, etc. So that leads for it to have a fairly small um, gross domestic product. Um, data on gross domestic product does vary slightly from source to source. Um, the large international organizations that compile this money, this information, um, is the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund. Um, we also um, have the World Bank, and they put together a list annually. Um, the United Nations puts together a list, and then the CIA also puts together a list. Um, so depending on what source you're using, you might find slightly different numbers. Okay all relate back to these three things here, um, not including the three sub-bullet points here. Um, and so I'm going to go over those in a little bit of more details. So first of all, first major shortcoming of um, the GDP and the GNP is that a lot of economic activity is actually in the world globally is actually never formally re recorded. 
because there might not be actual any, any money attached to it. So this would be things like subsistence farming that a family does. They don't actually sell the food, but they are doing the work and then eating the food. That is obviously um, an important measure of how well, well off a country is. It does not get factored into the GDP because there's no dollars attached to it. Same with bartering. Um, when I agree to do something and you agree to do something back in, in, in return for me, that is helping and um, in many cases helpful to a society, but because we haven't exchanged money, it's not part of the formal economy. It does not get measured into the GDP. Other um, instances of this would be people who are um, perhaps working in a developing country like this street vendor here. Um, he may not be formally registered with the government and he may not be paying taxes. And um, as a result, the um, um, his um, his activities are not being registered um, as part of this GDP. And the other big one example that gets um, used oftentimes is that there's a lot of highly valuable activity that we do in this world that is not paid and therefore it's not considered to be an economic activity. So this would be like charity and volunteering work, um, raising children, and all of the housework, caring for the elderly, things like that. Um, and then finally, this final component of the informal economy is a lot of, not a lot, but some economic activity is carried out illegally. So um, that is also then left out of the GDP and the GNP. So that's the first major criticism, is that we are leaving out informal economy activities. Another major criticism is that um, depletion of natural resources and other environmental impacts of economic exchange are not taken into account. So when we destroy a forest in order to make lumber or um, paper, or we pollute a river in order to make textiles, those things actually increase our GDP because they end up with goods and services that can be bought and sold. Um, and we never then factor into that the cost that it has on the natural resources and our environment. So um, an example that I could give to you here is um, how oftentimes high economic growth um, can really rapidly increase GDP, GNP. Um, and make it seem like a lot of development is happening within a country and a lot of progress is being made. But oftentimes, high economic growth that's fueled through capital spending can hide a number of sustainability pro problems, um, which we've just sort of showed about, talked about. So for the example I want to talk to you about is this the city of Dubai. Dubai is a city in the Middle Eastern country of the United Arab Emirates. Um, and it has experienced what could only be accurately described as a complete explosion of economic growth in recent years. They have an annual economic growth, growth rate in that city of 6.1%, which is more than double of what is um, being experienced by most developed countries around the world. And it has become a city that's been truly described as a city of luxuries. They've had rapid urbanization. Um, which has increased the GDP of the city and of the country, UAE. Um, so you would think that that is a positive thing. Um, but unfortunately, rapid urbanization has led to a, an array of environmental issues. Um, this city was built in the middle of a desert. Um, there aren't a lot of resources such as food, water, building materials, um, in the region. So all of those things are having to be imported in. Um, and um, there is, um, like you, we've read in last, just like it's, we read last week about Saudi Arabia, um, there is not enough water in Dubai. Um, it has one of the lowest levels of precipitation in the entire world. Um, it's actually one of the highest water users of all countries um, and cities in the world. Um, and 
obviously this is a fundamental conflict. There's hardly any water, but it's one of the biggest users of water. Um, and so most of the water in Dubai comes from desalination, which we learned about last week. We're taking salt water um, and we are desalinizing it, which we learned um, is highly energy intensive. Um, it's a major, Dubai as a city is a major consumer of electricity. Their main source of electricity is natural gas. Um, and they are dependent on fossil fuel energy to support all of their lighting and cooling needs that they have within this, um, within this city. Um, so serious environmental issues happening within the country, despite the fact that we're seeing this rapid economic growth. So we have a conflict in the, in the environment and the economics. Um, the United Arab Emirates also has some serious social issues that are being um, hidden um, through economic development within the country. Um, the government is, is known for a number of human rights violations, such as randomly detaining people, um, people disappearing and never being seen again, um, particularly when they criticize the government and um, other authorities. Um, there's also a lot of reports that the people who are, uh, most of the people who are actually doing the building and construction work in Dubai are migrant workers from other countries such as Pakistan. And there's a lot of concern that they are being treated as slave laborers. Um, and um, just like we see in the apparel industry with sweatshops in developing countries with poor working conditions, poor living conditions, that's what these migrant workers are facing as well. Um, there's also a very large population of domestic, um, female domestic workers in the country, so servants, and they are excluded almost entirely from any protections. And so there's no protections over how long they work, how much they get paid, what their living conditions are like, etc. So we have this shiny, beautiful um, city that we hear a lot about, people going on vacation to. Um, we think that they are... Um, being very successful economically, um, but then if we dig a little deeper, we see that there are these environmental and social issues in the country that just aren't being talked about. Um, further shortcomings of GDP and the GNP um, is that oftentimes destructive activities within a country can actually cause the GDP to go up. So examples, um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico or Hurricane Katrina. These were um, activities that, you know, cost our country um, billions of dollars, um, also obviously um, took the lives of humans and the lives of destroyed ecosystems and um, other living organisms as well. In the long run, however, both of these um, um, disasters caused GDPs and GNPs to increase because of the amount of money that was spent on cleanup and recovery. Um, so there's obviously something wrong with an economic measure if destruction causes an increase in the GDP. So in order to really think about what is development and what is economic development, um, you really have to think about um, what does it mean, what does well-being mean? What does it mean, what does human welfare mean? And we talked about um, at the beginning of this lecture how this is a normative issue. And that means, what I mean by normative issue is that it's open to personal interpretation and subjectivity. What I believe it takes to have a quality life that I would define as um, um, a, a, a life of dignity and respect is probably different than what other people would define as, as being necessary. However, that being said, the United Nations mm -hmm. says that human development is about creating an environment in which people can develop their full potential and lead productive, creative lives in accord with their needs and interests. People are the real wealth of nations. 
Development is thus about expanding the choices people have to lead the lives that they value. I think that this is incredibly important when we think about what is human development um, and economic development. Economic development is about helping people develop to their full potential, helping people lead productive lives, helping people lead creative lives, um, expanding the choices that people have to lead the lives that they value, to lead the lives that they want to lead. So how do we actually measure this? What, what do we need? Um, what is considered a life of um, meeting human needs and letting us, giving us choices and freedoms? Um, does it mean that we have political freedom? Does it mean that we have enough food and water to drink and eat? Um, does it mean that we have self-esteem and we feel good about ourselves? Um, how should we be measuring human welfare beyond just how much goods and services are being bought and sold within a country? So I'm going to give that to you. What do you believe people need in order to develop, to lead, to develop to their full potential to lead a productive and creative life? Or the reverse of that, what do you believe is currently preventing some people in the world from developing into their full potential? Um, and if you want to think about this in the context of a specific country, you want to think about um, India. What, what's happening in the country of India that's preventing some people from developing into their full potential? Um, so either way, um, I want you to answer this. I want you to just sort of think about this, um, jot down some personal ideas, and um, you will email them to me before the end of this lecture, but I have one more slide of questions that I want you to reflect on as well. So um, go ahead and pause the, the lecture and then think about this and then come back in a minute. All right. So we talked about how gross domestic product is not a good measure of well-being, not a good measure of human development. What we do have, though, instead is this index called the Human Development Index. And this is an attempt to capture a broader view of development in the sense that it um, attempts to say development involves not only an increase in income, but also an expansion of capabilities of individuals. Human capital, in terms of education and health, is one of the most important determinants and indicators of capa the capabilities of an individual. How much you know and how healthy you are um, d determines how much you're going to be able to contribute to society. They capture very important aspects of socioeconomic development that gross domestic product does not capture. So in the 1990s, early 1990s, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, developed the Human Development Index. And this includes per capita income, so income is not excluded, um, but it also includes human capital. And human capital is this idea of how long do people live and how much do people know. And this is the Human Development Index. It's published annually by the United Nations in their Human Development Reports. And it's essentially these reports are a summary of human development around the world. And basically it implies that um, when you can, you can look at the Human Development Index every year and determine if a country is developed, still developing, or underdeveloped based on these three aspects of well-being. Longevity, how long we're living. Knowledge, which is measured specifically by literacy rates or education levels, how long we go to school. Um, and the standard of living, purchasing power. How much does it how much can we purchase in a country? How much, how far does our dollar go, basically, um, is what we're measuring. So we're looking at longevity, knowledge, and standard of living 
compiling those three together into a value, we can then take that and rank every country around the world by the overall development in these three areas. It can be very helpful in answering how two countries with relatively the same GDP per capita can end up with very different human development outcomes overall. So I want to actually play with this for a second. Um, I want you to click on the calculator icon that's on your screen and that's going to hyperlink you to um, a human development index calculator. And you can go ahead and plug in these numbers um, to see how the United States ends up with its particular human development score. Currently, um, the United States human development score is sitting right at about 0.92 when you round up. Um, we have a, um, four numbers that we plug in to the human development score. Um, the first one is life expectancy at birth, and this is capturing this idea of longevity. Um, currently, life expectancy at birth average between men and women is 78.94 years. Um, understanding knowledge is um, calculated by two terms, two, two values. Um, the mean number of years that people in the United States go to school for, which currently is sitting at 13.3 years, and the expected years of schooling, um, which is sitting at 16.8. Um, and then the final value, which is GDP, US GDP per capita, which is currently sitting just at around 51,000 per person. So go ahead, hyperlink um, by clicking on the calculator, type in those four values. Um, you could also then play around with it a little bit and you know say, okay, keep um, the knowledge and the income the same, but increase our life expectancy or decrease our life expectancy and etc and see what that does with the GDP. So hopefully um, that sort of comes helps you see a little bit um, in terms of what we're actually doing with the Human Development Index. This is a current ranking of the 2016 rankings. Obviously 2017 rankings aren't out yet um, and this is just the top um, 15, 16 countries. There were two countries, the United States and Canada, that were both tied for number 10. Um, and this shows you that currently Norway is the most highest rank in terms of economic development according to the HDI um, in the country. Um, if you look at the top 16 countries, you'll notice that um, they are mostly all what you would think of as traditionally developed countries. Um, there are a couple of Asian countries, although Hong Kong isn't a country in of itself, it's measured separately because it is sort of considered to be a republic of China. Um, but beyond that, um, they are all European or North American countries. So the second thing I'd like you to do now is take this and compare the previous slide that we had earlier in this lecture that ranked the top GDP countries. Take that slide and compare it with this slide on the HDI rankings and just write down a couple of things of what you observe. When you compare the two sets of rankings, what are you observing? What are you seeing? What are you wondering about? So go ahead and jot that down. Um, and then, um, Bef when, when you exit out of the lecture, make sure you email both of those um, um, musings for me so that I'll know that you um, went through them and completed this lecture. Then finally, um, is so we have the GDP, we have gross national income, we have the Human Development Index. Is Human Development Index enough? Does it accurately measure a country's level of development? Well, according to the United Nations Development Program, which developed the Human Development Index, the answer is no. It's definitely better than gross domestic product, um, but ultimately the concept of human development is much broader than what could be captured by four numbers or any other type of index. Um, the Human Development Index, for example, does nothing to for, reflect how much political participation happens in a country or how much gender equality or inequality there is in a country. 
Um, so the, GD, the HDI and any other composite index that we might have can only offer very a broad proxy on some of these key issues of human development. Um, a fuller picture of how well a country is doing in terms of human and economic development requires us to consider other things. Um, more information and more analysis. Um, so like for example, maybe we want to think about um, how many doctors there are in a country as a measure of human welfare, how many TVs there are, how many cars there are, um, what type of diseases, how healthy we are, um, how, what are our stress levels, what are our crime levels. These are all things um, that um, may or may not be important as a measurement of human welfare. Um, and so uh, stemming from that, we have all sorts of other in development indexes out there. Um, these are all been hyperlinked in case you want to explore some of them. Um, we have an index called Where to Be Born. This is published by the um, Economist Intelligent Unit, which is obviously a large economic think tank in the world. Um, they publish The Economist along with other things. Um, this basically looks at countries around the world um, and analyzes them in terms of which ones have um, the potential to provide highest quality of life. And they include things like health, safety, prosperity, etc. We have another index called the Happy Planet Index, and this measures um, sustainable well-being and tells us how well we're doing in terms of achieving long, happy, sustainable lives. Um, the multi-poverty in Multi-Dimensional Poverty Index is an international measure of acute poverty. So it's really looking at um, how, how many people are living under acute poverty conditions um, and weighting that differently than what the Human Development Index would be able to do. Um, this is also by the United Nations. Um, and then we have another really interesting index called the Gender Empowerment Measure. This is an index that's designed to measure gender equality in a country. Um, it's part of the United Nations Development Program and it's part of their attempt to measure gender inequalities across the globe um, based on um, women's relative economic income, our participation in high paying positions, our access to professional, and professional positions as well as government positions. So those are just four other indexes that are out there. Um, there's many, many others as well. At this point, you are actually ready to now, before you move on to lecture 6.2, go into the discussion forum. I've given you enough background information now that I've posed three questions for you in this week's discussion forum that I want you to reflect on. Um, it may be helpful for you to hyperlink to some of these indexes before you answer those questions so you have a better sense of what um, people are using out there to measure human development and economic well-being.